A tri-state digital buffer. If you don't know what that is, check out my previous video, just search for tri-state digital buffer. This video is on how to make one using BJTs. Now generally you don't want to do this unless you do it for learning or fun like me. The best way is obviously to buy a chip, but let me show you what I came up with. So the tri-state buffer has three different outputs possible, high, low, and high impedance. A BJT that's in open collector mode and turned off, not conducting, is going to be high impedance. So that's how we're going to accomplish this. Now there's three different situations you can be in when you're trying to hook these together. You could have a pull up resistor, a pull down resistor, or no pull resistor on the output. So you have multiple buffers and then they're connected together in a bus. So you could have a pull up resistor, pull down resistor, or no resistor on that bus. It's not part of the buffer, it's just on the bus. Let's first look at the situation where you have a pull down resistor and see how we can do it. So we have a pull down resistor. The output is thus. So because there's a pull down resistor, that takes care of two of our outputs. Because if the BJT we connect to this is outputting low, then it's low anyway. And if it's outputting high impedance, then the pull down resistor is gonna make it low. So we don't actually need to put out a low. If we put out high impedance, then that counts for high impedance and for low, because the purpose of high impedance is to make sure we don't intake anything. You know, if something else on the bus is high, we don't wanna be pulling in that high into the BJT. So all we actually need to do is be high impedance or be high so that we override the pull down resistor. Of course, it's pulling down, that would help. So high or high impedance, that sounds like a PNP. So if we just connect a PNP open collector with our power, boom. Now we can turn on and off the PNP and we get our high or high impedance. But we have two signals. We have the data signal and the enable signal. We need to use both of these to drive this. So we need a second PNP. Toss on our base resistors, data signal, enable signal, and boom. Both of these have to be open for high to go through, otherwise it's high impedance, except remember that a PNP is active low, not active high, which means Data and enable both have to be low to turn this on. We want them to be high, not low. So we have to negate these signals. Well, we can use a simple logic gate. Let's have two NPNs, one here and one here. I won't bother to hook it up because spoilers, I'm about to not do that. But if I made two inverters out of this, put data and enable through it and put it into there, it would work fine. Cool, we're done. But this is wasteful. We're being redundant. We have two transistors here being driven by two signals and two transistors here. Do we really need all that? What if we combine these? Because the point of having these two together is to jointly cut off the current flow. Instead of having inverters feeding the PNPs, what if we just have one PNP being fed by the NPNs? Now we're getting somewhere. Data and enable, both high, of course with base resistors, connected through the ground, and then open collectors through the PNP. When data and enable are both high, both NPNs will open and ground will go through to base, which will open up the PNP and high will go to the output. If either of these are not conducting, then the ground cannot get through to the collector, which means the PNP will not conduct and it will be high impedance. Now that'll leave it floating. If this is open collector and it's closed off, then the input of this base is floating. I'm going to say that's not a problem because this is not something you would do in a production device. This is something for a home product. You're just messing around. It works perfectly fine on my breadboard. As long as you don't have crazy conditions, you're not going to have an electrostatic discharge high enough, strong enough, and long enough to power a base of a BJT. And you're not going to really have leakage current internally, blah. So in my experience, don't worry about it. Making a real device, buy a chip. Now, could we get this down to two transistors? No, and here's why. Let's say, instead of doing all this PNP stuff, we do NPNs directly. In principle, there's no reason we couldn't do this because we've got ground through here. We can forward bias base emitters and turn it on or off and get high through or not through. But look at the path. We've got the emitter connected to the load. You're supposed to have the collector connected to the load. That's why it's called open collector. If data is low, then this should not be conducting. We want this to be high impedance and thus the pull down resistor makes it low. So data is low, but enable is high. What if enable is high? It doesn't matter, data is low, it still shouldn't conduct, but we go high through base emitter and out 
which means even though we're not getting to the power through the normal spot, we're getting to the power through the enable signal. The enable signal will turn on this NPN and will drive the output. It will override the pull-down resistor. And the output will see the rail voltage minus the base emitter diode drop. That's why we can't do that. That's why you have to be careful to connect a collector to a load, not an emitter. So we have to use the PNP. And if we do, then everything is peachy. So it takes three transistors if you have a pull-down resistor, and there you go. One final wrinkle. Let's say I flip these signals. Let's say I have data here and enable here. It still works perfectly fine. No reason to not. Except when enable is low, it doesn't matter what data is doing. We don't need data to do anything. If enable is low, we want everything to be shut off. And we expect enable to be low a significant portion of the time. We expect to have this buffer on only a portion of the time because we've got a whole bunch of buffers and only one's going to be on at a time. So if there's four signals and each of them is transmitting roughly equal amounts of time, then this will only be on a quarter of the time. So enable is going to be low a lot. So let's say enable is low and data is high. Circuit works just fine, but data being high will conduct base to emitter and out. Doesn't hurt anything, but it wastes power. So if we have enable here, whenever it's low, which is most of the time greater than half, then it will not be putting any power through its base emitter. And data, this NPN will have no connection to ground on the emitter. So it cannot forward bias and it cannot conduct. So other than leakage and crap, this, when enable is low, will draw zero current whatsoever. This one will be cut off, this one will be cut off, and this one will be cut off. And the only current flowing would be possibly through the pull-down resistor. If output is connected to a high voltage in order to read a low or something. If output's also connected to ground, the whole thing will draw no current at all, which is great. So putting enable next to ground cuts off data and saves power. So that's a pull-down resistor. What happens if we have a pull-up resistor? Well, we don't have to go through this whole derivation again because the joy of BJTs, of transistors in general, is their symmetry. If I take PNPs and NPNs and swap them for NPNs and PNPs, take everything, flip it upside down, that should be it. So that's always the first thing you try. Just flip it around. So instead of a pull-down resistor, we have a pull-up resistor. So instead of a PNP, we have an NPN. And instead of these NPNs, we have PNPs. And we once again connect them, open collector, don't forget the base resistor, to drive the NPN. And then also flip data and enables positions so that enable is near high and will cut off data. And there you go. They'll both be cut off and the NPN will be turned off. Except we did it again. We flipped the signals. The PNPs are active low. For data, that's correct. We want this NPN to be open to low when data is low. We want it to be high impedance with a pull-up resistor when data is high or enable is low. So that's actually the right thing to do, but it's not for the enable. So now we need to invert the enable signal, right? You should know better than that. Enable should open a transistor when it's high. An NPN is opened when it's high. Can we just do that? Well, we just went over this. Now we've got an emitter pointing towards the load. That's bad, right? It can be, but in this case, it's not. So what happens if enable is high and data is low? We have an interesting little U-turn. Enable high, data low. So enable is high, data is low. Instead of biasing to the normal base emitter that we're used to and going away from the load, high on enable goes to base emitter, forward biases. Goes to emitter base, forward biases, because data is low. So they bias open in this little U-turn format and open up and connect high to drive the NPN on to open up so that low overrides the pull-up resistor. But we do still have base emitter in the load path, so high, base emitter, so that's one diode drop, emitter collector, so that's 0.02 volts, we ignore it, so we're still one diode drop, and then base emitter, that's another diode drop, and out to here. So this base emitter is seeing a loss of voltage of one diode drop. Does that matter? Probably not. I'm probably going to use 5 volts to drive this. So instead of 5 volts coming to base, you've got 4.3 volts coming to base. That's still going to be plenty to turn this on and drive it into saturation. The output is not going to see that loss because the output is connected to the collector of this NPN. In order for this NPN to turn on, base must be a diode drop above the emitter. You have to have a diode drop from base to emitter. So if emitter were high, if emitter 
emitter were straight rail voltage, let's say 5 volts out of 5 volts. Well, base can't go above 5 volts. Base is capped at the 5 volts too, so that can't turn on. So we have to bring emitter down to 4.3 volts to get base at 5 volts in order to get the NPN on. And if emitter is at 4.3 volts, then that means the collector, which is at 5 volts, base emitter and collector emitter are both dropping that 0.7 volts. And it's gone at this point. It doesn't for this because we've got emitter base here. So this base has to be another diode drop below its emitter, but that's fine because the emitter is at 4.3 volts and we can subtract 0.7 from that at the base. The base can be lower without the collector being lower, but for the NPN, the emitter has to be lower. So that's something you have to consider when you're doing a trick like this. But like I said, for us, it doesn't matter because we're only losing one diode drop. And as long as the supply voltage is high enough, we don't care at all. And it saves us a transistor. So does it work in the other situations? If enable is low, then that means the NPN cannot be open. Base emitter, you can't go lower than low, so there's no way for base emitter to be forward biased. So this high can't get through. And enable is low, so it's not providing a high. So this emitter can never see a high, which means the base can never forward bias and turn on this one. So with enable low, the PNP is correctly cut off. If data is high, then you can never, no matter, you know, this high gets through, but if base is high, then emitter base can never be forward biased. So the PNP can never open even if enable is trying to open. So it correctly cuts off. And the power saving is still there because if data is low and enable is low, then again, there's no access to high for there to be stray wasteful emitter base current. So with data low, it's not going to be draining if enable is low. If it were, it would be fine, but it would be wasteful. So that condition is still fulfilled. So this is exactly the same as the other one, completely just reflected except an NPN there. So the first one requires a pull down resistor because otherwise there's no way for it to give a low signal. This one requires a pull up resistor because otherwise there's no way for it to give a high signal. What if we want to do it so that we could have a pull up resistor, a pull down resistor, or no resistor, and it wouldn't matter. We could hook it up any of the three ways and it wouldn't care and it would work just fine. We're in luck. We just take these two designs and staple them together. You know I'm going to smile real big at this because of how symmetrical it is. This actually ends up being a push-pull output. Now normally you'd say, but I thought the NPN was supposed to be on top and the PNP on bottom for a push-pull. That's for analog signals where you have dual rail voltage and you're using some sort of feedback with something like an op amp to regulate it. Push-pull just means current can go out and come in. It can source and sync current. So there are multiple different ways to do push-pull. This one can have current going out the PNP through the load. It can have current going through the load through the NPN, or if both of them are off, high impedance and the load is not connected on this side. Now, if you had both on at the same time, such as when you switch, they can briefly be on at the same time and you have essentially a short circuit through them. This is called shoot through and you can add preferably small resistors if you want to prevent that. But especially since we're using discrete BJTs here and it's going to be super brief, it's not going to be a problem. It'll draw crazy current for an instant. It'll generate excess heat for an instant and then it'll just go away again. So it's really not a problem. It will shoot through, probably. It may not, but it probably will briefly. It's not going to hurt anything because the, the, you won't even have to heat sink it. It'll just dissipate away. This is the one that requires a pull down resistor. This is the one that requires a pull up resistor. They're just connected together. When enable is low, this NPN is closed off, which means this base cannot get any current and the PNP is off. When enable is low here, that means this NPN is closed off, which means this NPN cannot get any current. This is closed off and it's high impedance. When enable is on, but data is low, then this NPN is closed off, so the PNP gets no current. But this PNP turns on with this enable turning on its NPN, which turns on the NPN. Data is low, output is low. When enable is high and data is high, this NPN turns on, so both of these are allowing current through to this PNP, and the PNP turns on. But data high prevents this PNP from turning on, so the NPN gets no current. So data high, output high. And there you go. You get the high rail, you get the low rail, and you get high impedance. If you connect it to a pull-down resistor, then whenever it's outputting low, 
there's no short circuit because it's low versus low, so it's just doing nothing. And if you put a pull-up resistor and it outputs a high, same thing, you'll have high versus high, and the resistor will have no voltage across it, and you'll just get a high signal. And then both this and the pull-up resistor will probably give you some current through the load, but you get the point. Point is it's not going to hurt anything. And it serves the role as well. Enable and data are both going into high-ish impedance inputs. You want higher impedance, you can use bigger resistors here. You know, use, use a mega ohm, I don't care. You can make this as high impedance as you want on inputs as long as the transistor still has enough current to turn on. You can check your data sheet. And you could even use Darlington. You can get Darlington, NPN, PNP, ZCLI, whatever, to further decrease the load on the inputs. And then the output is being driven by this connection to high, or it's just syncing whatever the load puts in. And so it fulfills all the roles of a tri-state digital buffer, electrical isolation, and power amplification without signal amplification. Pretty cool. Not useful, because this is something you do because you want to, not because it's a good thing to do. But hey, you learned, and you might have a use for it at some point. The benefit of this is if for some reason you need a ton of current, or a ton of power even, to go through you can just use, you know, parallel transistors or power transistors and resistors. You can put whatever parts you want in here. And so if, if for whatever reason you need a tri-state digital buffer that can drive a ton of power, well, there you go. Just make sure that the, the floating bases here aren't going to be a problem. They're probably not. But just test before you start soldering. Let me know if you have any questions. But if not, I'll be seeing you.